Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick. Tonight, we're exploring markets across Europe, so we're in for a real treat. But before we begin, I just have a few introductory comments to make. First, we wanted to remind you that you can sign up for future MNT shows at ricksteves.com MNT. At this page, you will also find a description of the menu for every week, so you can have the same snacks as Rick, which we know you all love. We also wanted to thank you for all the posts we've been seeing on Instagram and Twitter of your Monday night travel rituals, whether it's your cat and dog watching or the wonderful meal you've prepared for the evening. So please keep on sharing those on Twitter and Instagram. We've really been enjoying them. At the bottom of your page tonight, you will find a Q&A widget. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the event, and at the end of the screening, we will have a Q&A session with Rick. My coworker, Ben Green, who you may know from other MNT shows, will be behind the scenes helping me answer your questions as well. Ben has also posted a list of links in the chat feature that relate to tonight's episode. So if you're wondering where Rick got his food tonight, or if you're interested in buying a Keep On Traveling t-shirt, you can find those links in the chat feature. Finally, you may notice that this presentation is being recorded for future use. Rest assured though, that only Rick and I are being recorded as both your audio and video are turned off. And now without further ado, we can go explore some markets with our tour guide this evening, Rick Steves. Hi, Rick. <laughs> hey, Julianne. I'm melting cheese. Look at that. This is <laughs> Alpine cheese. And I've got, I borrowed a raclette maker or a little grill. And I'm just uh, melting my, my Alpine cheese and I'm gonna drizzle it on what you're supposed to drizzle it on when you go to the French Alps and, uh, and you've worked up an appetite hike. And so I'm just gonna, ooh, it's, it's great. I'm just gonna shovel all this stuff onto my boiled potatoes. Oh, look at that. <laughs> and my little onions and my pickles and my wonderful charcuterie. So um, I'm gonna show you more of my meal in a moment and my wine, but right now I just wanna welcome you. Thank you for joining us on Monday Night Travel. And as Julian mentioned, today we're gonna to be going to markets and I just love markets. I just love going to Europe. You know, in normal times, I'll spend a hundred days a year in Europe. And when I'm home, I'm still traveling all over the country enthusing about European travel. I can't do that this year, but I can enthuse on Mondays. So this is just a real blessing for me to be able to get together, to enjoy some nice wine, learn about the wine, make sure it fits what we're eating and so on, and to uh, invite you into my home. I, it's so fun to scamper around as if I've got company. I got a couple thousand people coming over tonight. I want to make sure my frame is right. I want to make sure that I got all my food in together. And welcome. I just hope that you can be at ease. I'm coming to your home. You're coming into my home. Hope you got your favorite travel partner there. Uh, something to drink, something to eat. Make yourself at home. The bathroom's just down the hall. There's ping pong downstairs. The deck is beautiful for the sunset. The uh, whole oh, baby just, it's nice to be together. Now, we're going to be going to the markets in a moment. I do want to remind you, we are having raclette. And uh, this is the raclette um, oven. I don't know if you can see that. It's just a grill and it's hot and I'm kind of thinking I'm going to, I, I could burn, I could very well burn myself if I'm not careful. So I'm just going to have another glass of this wine and make sure I stay safe. This wine is a white wine from Savoy. And Savoy is the Department of France up by Chamonix, Mount Blanc, the tallest mountain in Europe. It's in Savoy. And when you look at a French bottle of wine, you can read a lot right onto it, right in there, the domain, that would be the, the, the farm. So that's the idyllic domain, probably. Domaine de la idyllique. And then the actual grape is Jacquer. And 100% uh, of the, uh, this, this wine is 100% Jacquer grape. And this is a fresh to be drunk uh, young wine that goes very good with the raclette. Now the raclette, it's kind of like fondue, I guess. You melt the cheese and you dip stuff in it. I'll show you my, my board here, but this is, this is all my, my raclette meal. And we've got our cheese, we've got our boiled potatoes, we got apples and we've got pears. You can dribble your cheese on that, a bowl of pickles and little silver onions and walnuts. Ah, you can, there's a million things you can drizzle your cheese on, but this is gonna be a nice meal here. And um, I'm going to also have a nice salad with it. And this is a chicory salad. That's sort of the, the curly endives. And we've got um, some beautiful um, curried cashews. We've got this wonderful French uh, bacon, the lardon. And this is something that they just, mm, you got to love bacon. And in France, this is even better than bacon. 
Mm. And I've got um, a dressing, which is a ginger lemon honey vinaigrette. So that's my chicory salad. And um, we're gonna eat well, we're gonna drink well, and we're gonna travel well. So thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna now do what I like to do on Monday night travel is go to ricksteves.com with my friends and remind you, this is where we keep all of our information. Information is our publicity stunt. So if you wanna get turned on about Europe, you go to ricksteves.com. All the TV shows we've ever made, 500 hours of radio, guides marketplace, 50 or so guides and they're doing all sorts of creative things virtually and most of it's free. Monday night travel. And in the bottom left-hand corner, we got Classroom Europe. Double click on that. And you can see this is a program we made. It's free, it's fun, there's no ads in it. It's for teachers and homeschooling parents. We got five, we got 150 TV shows. We broke them into about 500 different uh, uh, searchable clips. And what, and you can put together any kind of playlist you want. And our theme today is markets. So I'm just gonna type in here, market. And then I'm gonna look and see which ones come up and we will click them and we'll make a playlist. For instance, Sicily, you gotta go to the markets in Sicily. So we'll add that to the playlist. What else might we wanna do with clips that have the word market in them? Rue Claire, oh, I love the little village life in Paris. And Rue Claire is a neighborhood market street. That is the best of Parisian markets. But in France, you wanna get out in the countryside, we're gonna to go to Sarlat. We're gonna to go to the wonderful market in Sarlat. And let's look at a few more markets here. I think, um, what would be another good market to visit? Oh, a Porto food tour. This is just a chance to have a guide take us through a market. I wanna do that. So we've clicked, uh, what have we clicked here? We've clicked four videos, so we got 23 minutes. And I'm gonna just, I wanna go to Tuscany because that's an important part of any tour. And let's look at traditional rural lifestyles in Tuscany. I click that, I've got five videos for 27 minutes of programming. There it is. I can save that playlist. I'm gonna give it a name and I'm gonna call it Monday Night Travel Markets. And if I hit save, we now have that market in my playlists. And anybody watching right now can, can create their own little log of their own little archive of playlists, or you can go to the public playlist and see what's available there. But here we have Monday Night Markets, five video clips that we cobbled together for our own interest and giving us 27 and a half minutes of travel fun. Does that make sense to you? So thank you for joining us right now. We're gonna go on this little journey and we're gonna start in Palermo. And I like to start in Palermo because it's a city with so much life in the streets and the markets are absolutely captivating. There's several wonderful markets. And one thing about Palermo's markets is they have this amazing song. Everybody's singing their, their sales pitches together. There's a cacophony. And then you go into this market and you just get lost in it. Uh, you know, the perception of Sicily can be different than what the actual experience is. So many people think organized crime. You can be so wrong when you go to Sicily because when I go to Sicily, I think wonderful markets. By the way, this opening, this opening um, uh, uh, on, uh, on camera is, uh, from the rooftop of a restaurant that we use in our hotels. It's where we have our breakfast. And we were with our crew there and we just thought this is a great place to do an on-camera from the breakfast terrace overlooking the great city of Palermo. Thank you so much for enjoying or joining us. And I hope you enjoy this look at markets in Europe. Let's go. Palermo is a great starting point to untangle the story of Sicily. The island was a thriving Greek colony 500 years before Christ. Then came ancient Rome for a few centuries and it fell. After some chaos, Sicily flourished again in the 9th and 10th centuries under Arab rule. Then in the 11th century, the Normans came. While that ushered in Sicily's glory days, the parade of conquerors just kept on coming. Palermo, Sicily's main city and historic capital, is a busy port corralled by mountains. A noisy and energetic metropolis, its architecture reflects the rule of its many overlords as well as its rich heritage. Walking the lively streets, you're surrounded by a scruffy elegance. The city invites exploration. You feel the city's boisterous spirit in its markets. Here at the gritty Ballero Market, you wander among a commotion of stalls, all competing for the buyer's attention. 
I was walking through this marketplace a couple of years before we came with the crew. And I just thought, we got to come back with the crew. And so many times I have an experience and I want to bring the crew back to share it. And it's just not the same, but it was the same when we came back. And now we're going to get sucked into this amazing market and we're going to enjoy the soundtrack of it as well as the fragrance and all the fun memories that you get just by wandering through a Sicilian market. It's an entertaining scene, complete with singing salesmen, each with his own unique style. Sanguinello, sanguinello. Ida scalona cinco mazzo nero. Momancio, o momancio. E c'è la goccia di nero, fa la goccia per piselli. Ecco la mia, non è il vero cavolo. Oh, stasera siamo un orno ai cinque. Scusi. Vedi che mi mangio la goccia di nero, va. Whether you understand the lyrics or not, this slice of life market action is some of the best in Europe. Uboli! And don't just gawk. Adventure in. Try something new. <laughs> just like his father did, Pipo sells the odd bits of the cow. It's all boiled from hoof to snout. And I'm picking its nose. Naso de vitello. Naso, bravo, bravo. Bolito! Bolito magro. All right. Prego. Delicioso. <laughs> so you, you, take, you take a little cow, you cut off his Bolito. nose, you boil it, sprinkle a little salt, you got a snack. <laughs> a thousand years ago, after Sicily was conquered by the Arabs in the ninth century, Palermo was one of Europe's leading cities. With a population of 100,000, it was second only to Cordoba in Spain. In its Arab days, it had about 300 mosques. Later, the Normans from France pushed out the Arabs and it became Christian again, building great churches where grand mosques once stood. Okay, so I gotta grab my, my look at that. Is that beautiful cheese or what? It is melting and now it is ready. To, oh, I almost lost my pickles. Um, it is ready to go on my plate of boiled potatoes and other goodies. And it is, I think this is a Hezra's kind of meal, but it is tasty and I'm loving it. Um, okay, we're gonna see a face montage right now. I mean, there's three. And when we look at these faces, I love doing face montages in my TV shows. Um, it, it illustrates that layer cake of cultures that, that, that make this island's markets just so amazing and it's people so endearing. Many civilizations stacked on top of each other over thousands of years give us the Sicily we enjoy today when we travel there. Sicily's complicated history of domination, which scrambled the gene pool, can be seen in the faces of its people. Carthaginians, Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Arabs, Normans, French, Spanish, and Italians have all captured and ruled this island at some point. Sicily's many rulers also left their mark with grand architecture. This gate was part of a once foreboding Spanish wall and the massive cathedral was funded by Normans from France. And what Italian city doesn't have a fine opera house? Conquerors also left their mark economically and socially. A history of absentee landlords dating all the way back to the Romans left Sicily mired in a persistent poverty. And centuries of this top-down oppression left a culture inclined to accept corruption and to be cynical toward the law. Because of that, organized crime, called the Mafia here, became a part of Sicilian society. This made Palermo a dangerous place. But the power of organized crime in Sicily has ebbed. In the 1990s, the government waged a vigorous campaign to finally rein in the Mafia. These two leading judges, who led the charge, were assassinated. This tragedy finally turned the public against organized crime. And today, it has nowhere near the power and influence it once had. While Palermo certainly retains its rustic character, in the last generation, the city has renewed itself with gentrified neighborhoods and upscale shops and hotels. And today, Palermo feels as safe as any Italian city. The 
The Quattro Canti, that means four corners, is a Palermo landmark. The intersection of two main thoroughfares, it divides the city into its four historic neighborhoods. The niches hold statues of the four Spanish kings of Sicily, another reminder of this island's many-layered history. So now we're going to get just a dose of the pedestrian-friendly nature of Palermo, the big, gnarly, formerly scary major city of Sicily, how that changes the character of a town. I remember when I first came here, these, this street was caked in soot from all the traffic. There was people parked on the sidewalks, just noise. It was not people friendly. Now, completely different experience. Pedestrian boulevards in shopping centers of beautiful towns. It's, it's a challenge for a lot of American cities to get their brains around this. In, in my beautiful little town here north of Seattle, you know, we're trying to get a couple of streets that'll be pedestrian only, but people just can't handle it. It's just very interesting to me. I've been advocating for this for a while, and it's just not something that fits the American uh, comfort zone very well. But when you do go to Europe, consider a big city like Palermo, with, which has a reputation of being a mess, and see how charming it is right now because they've committed their streets not to cars, but to people, to pedestrians, to shoppers. From here, early each evening springs the ritual of the passeggiata. Strolling from here to the opera house is endlessly entertaining, offering vignettes of local life and culture. As the workday ends, people gather at their favorite hangouts. Here at Taverna Azzurra, it's a colorful scene where the neighborhood gang enjoys the same old routine, but a never boring conviviality. Behind Palermo's rough facades hides some welcoming aristocratic elegance. So there's Alvina. I'm getting, my, uh, my cheese is bubbling and looking really good. So I'm gonna scrape it onto my boiled potatoes here. Oh, I'm getting good at this, whoa. Um, and you know, all over Europe, you've got this uh, sort of phenomenon of elegant aristocratic old wealth families that are land poor, but uh, land rich, but cash poor. And there's a lot of taxes, a lot of upkeep and so on. And they just have to scramble to make ends meet. So noble families all over Europe open their houses up like Alvina right here. So groups can come in, individuals can come in. If you get a chance to do it, it's fascinating. I can think of five or six around Europe right now where we take our groups and we get in. This is one of the tour stops on our Sicily tour, for example. This is a chance for you to get into a home of a noble family and get a sense of what's off of the street. The streets are rough and tumble. Step through that big door. Well, you're gonna see what happens right now when you get to know Alvina and her husband, Count Federico. We're joining a tour of the palace of a Sicilian noble family. Count Federico and his Austrian wife, like many nobles, need to open their world to the common masses in order to pay their bills. The charming Countess Alvina shows us around with an engaging joy. So this is where you came in and now we do the whole tour around the courtyard. You can see we here have a long line of rooms going through, but they're actually not straight. They're a bit curved because we're here on top of the Punic Roman city wall. You must imagine more than 2,000 years of history under our feet. Look, these are some of my husband's ancestors. From the, the 16th century on, uh, everybody uh, lived here in the house and uh, everybody was born in the house. Yeah, if you want to stay for dinner tonight, we have, uh, we can do spaghetti aglio olio. Look, we've got lots of aglio, garlic. And actually, this is where I love to, actually to lie on the sofa, read my book, and look how beautiful to dream under fresco like this. The Count has stolen me away into his private studio, a kind of aristocratic man cave, to share his passion for Italian racing cars. His enthusiasm overcame any language barrier. 
And our group's in luck as Alvina's circle of musical friends has assembled to share their love of traditional Sicilian choral music. Okay, I want to do a little um, show and tell about raclette because that's the featured meal tonight. And as you know, my little humble raclette cooker here, my grill, is not quite as romantic as what they have in France and Switzerland. So I wanted to play you just a little clip. This is uh, happens to be in Zermatt, but it could be in Chamonix also. When you get high in the Alps, you have raclette. And I'll show you here, they have a, a, a big clamp or a vice and they put a big hunk of cheese on it and they heat it up and they scrape the melted cheese onto their potatoes and so on. Um, let Amade, our guide here in Zermatt, show us what raclette is all about and then I'll show you mine. Capping my day in Amade's favorite restaurant to learn about Swiss cuisine and wine. What are we eating? Well, we're eating here the typical local menu. It's called raclette. Mm -hmm. And how you can see it's melted cheese, mm -hmm boiled potatoes, pickles, and silver onions. Very simple. It's very simple, mm -hmm. and they started many, many years ago in our area. How do they make the raclette? Well, it's actually very simple. You need a raclette stove. Mm -hmm. And the raclette stove is a very high heat on the top. You put the cheese on that heat, and then it melts. And as soon as it bubbled, you scrape it off, put it in a plate, and serve it with boiled potatoes, pickles, and onions. Very simple. Swiss white wine, I, I find it very good. What is the name? It's Fanda. Fanda. It's a simple local wine, mm -hmm. and it fits very well with the raclette. Yeah. So you, you do not see Swiss wine in the United States? Not really, no, because we don't export it a lot. First of all, we don't produce a lot. Secondly, it's quite pricey to export. And third, we want to drink the wine ourselves. Here's ah, the Fanda. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and wish you all the best. Now, Amade, thank you so much. So uh, I just want to kind of show you what I've got going on here because I don't have Amade and I'm a rookie when it comes to this, but there's my cooker and you can see my, can you see my cheese burning there? Uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my cheese now without burning my hand. There we go. And uh, so you just drizzle that on your food and it's actually, oh, the more you do this, the more you realize the, the, attraction of it because it creates a convivial atmosphere um, and when you know what you're doing and you've had a beautiful day of hiking and you're high in the alps and you get together with your friends and you have a raclette or a fondue it's quite nice again i want to remind you i've got all of these different things that we can put in our raclette so we could uh, we could feature the the apples and the pears course the main thing is the boiled potatoes you got your pickles you got your walnuts you got your cold cuts from your charcuterie board and then you've got your in in the Savoy this is the the Alpine department of France you got your chicory uh, salad with beautiful beautiful spicy uh, cashews and your French bacon and you want to wash it down with something that is correct and that would be wine from the same region if you can do it and that's what I've got here is my beautiful white wine from the Savoy and it all just goes together so well. Yeah. Mm. By the way, remember anytime we were featuring food, you can find out about the restaurant that we got it from uh, and uh, more about the menu and so on uh, in the notes from tonight's show. Right now, we're gonna go to France and we're gonna go to Paris. And in Paris, remember it's a collection of neighborhoods. It's a collection of neighborhoods and you got to choose what's your neighborhood when you stay in France. Every time I go to France, I like to stay in the area between Napoleon's tomb and the Eiffel Tower. And it's right along Rue Claire. This is a, not a market, it's a market street. Every day of the week, people go here to shop in that neighborhood. So we're going to take in a walk through Rue Claire. We're going to put together a meal, one course at a time. And we're going to start this with a little walk by the Notre Dame. Tragically, a couple of years ago, the Notre Dame burned. And the lacy black spire you're going to see on the top of this uh, beautiful Gothic church tragically crashed right to the ceiling. You'll see the spire that's on the ground after this horrific fire. Then we'll walk a few blocks away and we will get to our neighborhood in Paris, Rue Claire. 
saw the band. Paris was born over 2,000 years ago on this island in the River Seine. And many of its highlights can be seen from popular sightseeing boats. There's the Notre Dame. And the Louvre Museum. And of course, the Eiffel Tower, built to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. Paris glitters with history. Even the bridges bestowed on the city by kings and emperors tell a story. Beyond its glorious monuments and buildings, Paris is a city simply in love with life. Delightful parks let commoners luxuriate like aristocrats. Here in Luxembourg Gardens, there's a tranquility and refined orderliness enjoyed by young and old. The gardens are impeccably tended. And for generations, children have launched dreams on this pond. To establish a foothold in Paris, I like to choose a neighborhood and make it home. Strolling market streets like this, Paris has a small town charm. For those learning the fine art of living Parisian style, market streets like Rue Claire are ideal. With the help of my local friend, Delphine Prejean, each shop provides an insight into Parisian life. Delphine's planning a dinner party and she's taking us along. Shopping on a street like this is just a delight, isn't it? It's really nice. We are very lucky to be able to, to walk on the street and have all these very different shops, which are very good for Because for in shopping. America, there's one, one stop shopping. We go to one big place. Uh, we have one street shopping here. One street shopping, is it? <laughs> one street shopping. I love that idea. And I also love just palling around with somebody whose family runs a hotel right there in that neighborhood. And Delphine's part of a many generation family uh, business. Our group stay with her uh, in their hotel, and they just treat us so well. But right now, she's just Citizen Delphine. She's neighbor Delphine, and she's taking me on the walk that she does when she puts together her shopping experience. By the way, I've got an app. It's free. It's called Rick Steves Audio Europe. It's got 50 or 60 tours around Europe. And one of the tours on Rick Steves Audio Europe is a guided walk right down the street. You could stick me in your ear. There's, there's photographs. You can even watch it when you're not there. But when you are in Europe, take advantage of those tours. You can get that little intimate walk right down the street like Delphine's going to take us on right now. Yes. The market street. It's a market street, it is. I think for the first course, it would be nice to put some shrimps and mayonnaise. OK. And uh, so you see, you have different types of shrimps. You have like different colors, different sizes as well. So we'll, I think we'll go for the moyenne, for the medium ones, which is very flavorful. Now it looks very fresh. So we'll have some meat tonight uh -huh. as the main course. And um, we know the neighbors would butcher. You know, my mom used to come here, and uh, so you can trust the quality. You can trust the quality. You know, you know that they give you advice as well. So I'm going to have a roasted buff, and I'm uh -huh. going to have a, to ask the man for for some tips. Donc pour euh, un rôti de bœuf, ce serait combien de temps euh, au four Au four, euh, 20 minutes. D'accord, très bien. Et combien de kilos pour 6 euh, personnes Un kilo, bah, pour 6 personnes, un kilo de fond, tout de suite. D'accord, très bien, merci monsieur. So what did he say So he said like 25 minutes, yeah. and for 6 people, uh, 1,200 grams. 1,200 grams Yes. For 6 For 6. Big people. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rick, a dinner without a cheese course is not complete. <laughs> Did you catch that? A dinner without the cheese course is not complete. I shall drink to that. I love the French cheese shops. And notice how every time Delphine goes into the shop, she greets them, they greet her. Her parents know the people, she knows the people. It's generation after, it's neighborhood. And when you buy your cheese or you buy your meat or you buy your flowers or you buy your wine, you're gonna have somebody that's gonna coach you along and help you and, and make sure you know what the options are. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful intimacy. I just, I really love it. Here we're going into this festival of mold, a cheese shop right across the street from where she buys the meat. We have to go and pick some, uh, some cheese uh -huh. before dessert, after main course. Uh -huh. And um, we'll have some, an assortment of different cheeses. So you create a variety? Yes, I create a small plate with different cheese. Yeah. So we'll have some, um, this one looks good, some good cheese, uh -huh. and uh, some blue, yeah. some camembert, Wait. and some hard cheese. 
good socially, I think. It is very good because you have more wine. The wine, more <laughs> cheese, more wine, more, more cheese. cheese. So once we know what we are eating, we are going to choose the wine. Okay. It's a beautiful shop. Yes, it's really nice. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. We are going to talk with the expert and we're going to tell him what I'm, I'm going to have for dinner and he's going to pick the right wines for oh, us. That's good, okay. And remember, when you go into a wine shop, it's designed like the country. You can just follow every region around that wine shop, all the best wines of France. There's a little rack of beer, and it's Belgian beer, because the Belgian beer is better than the French beer. But here we got Delphine capping it. She doesn't go to the wine shop until she's done all the other shopping, but she doesn't want to buy the wine until she knows what she's going to be cooking. Then she huddles with the, 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 the wine merchant, and she gets the right bottle of wine. Look at all those fine French wines for the equivalent of six or seven dollars each. Remember, in France, you can drink outside, unlike the United States. You can buy your, your bottle of wine, and they've got little plastic wine glasses to go and head off to the, the park. The park in front of the Eiffel Tower is just three blocks away. In France, with so many wines to choose from, expert advice is welcome. He recommends a white for the shrimp, a full-bodied red from the Rhone Valley for the beef, and another white, this time from the Loire Valley, for the cheese plate. It's nice to have the uh, advice for yes. the, little de the little details of the menu. In France, any good meal comes with fresh bread, and that requires a visit to the local boulangerie. So we'll have some bread for dinner. No meal without today's bread. Today's bread. <laughs> yes, no French, no party. <laughs> <laughs> today's bread. I mean, I'm into good bread, but I've got a lot of bread in the freezer right now, and I'm going to thaw it out, and it'll be kind of today nuts. It's just, it's good bread. But they have today's bread. They, they, the French intentionally have small refrigerators, a little tiny mini fridge under the sink. So they have to go to the market every morning and check in with their neighbors. The French enthusiastically pay too much for their bread in order to buy it from the person who baked it. I'm just charmed by that. It's a Beautiful, beautiful slice of Parisian and French culture. So we'll have some uh, baguettes and uh, we will have some uh, some uh, special bread as well for the cheese. Oh, so some, a variety of bread with the cheese first. Yes. Perfect. And the final touch, flowers for the table. It's very bright and they're going to be beautiful on my table. It's great. Nearby, Sarlat is the pedestrian-friendly main town of the River Valley. It's just... Okay, so we just saw the big city and the Market Street in action. And by the way, Rue Claire, it's a wonderful place to call home. It's my home in Paris. Uh, all of our groups stay there when I'm filming. Our, two, our, our film crew stays there. Rue Claire, C-L-E-R. It's between Napoleon's tomb and the Eiffel Tower. And then you become at home with that beautiful street we just saw. There's four or five reasonably priced hotels right there. Now we're going to go to the Dordogne. The Dordogne is the flip side of the French coin. It's not the big city, it's the rustic and remote countryside. I say remote because it's not on the bullet train route. It's not served greatly by the uh, auto route. It's hard to get to, it takes time to get to it. That keeps a little bit off the mainstream. And the Dordogne is famous for its ancient caves, but what it's really beloved for, especially among the British, is it's the force fed, uh, um, geese, the livers of the forced fed geese, the foie gras. So we're going to, um, we're going to check out Sarlat. It's the market day and the market day is Wednesday or Saturday. So you got to do your studying here. You don't want to come into Sarlat on Thursday and Friday. You don't want to miss the market. We're going to check out the market and then we're going to learn about the foie gras. Right size, large enough to have a cinema with four screens, but small enough so that everything is an easy meander from the town center. It's the handiest home base for exploring the Dordogne. There are no blockbuster sites here. Still, it's an inviting tangle of traffic-free cobblestone lanes and handsome buildings lined with foie gras shops. Keith just hates our lot. And in the summer, stuffed with tourists. Sarlat's elaborate stonework recalls its glory century from about 1450 to 1550, after the Hundred Years' War. Loyal to the French cause through thick and thin in a century of war, Sarlat was rewarded by the king with lots of money to rebuild in stone. Sarlat's new nobility built noble homes to match. The town's most impressive buildings date from this prosperous era, when the Renaissance style was in vogue. It's market day and the city's jammed as it has been for centuries of Saturdays. Everything's fresh and local, so seasonal that shoppers can tell the month by what's on sale. 
This has been going on for a thousand years almost, since the Middle Ages. What's this region known for in cuisine? Well, the Dordogne is famous for three things. Walnuts, cakes and nuts and So all olives. this is walnuts in yeah, Greece. That's the this, walnut yeah. table. Mm -hmm. Truffles, which are a mushroom. It you'll find only fresh in the winter, so you won't see it in the market today. And the biggie, what people come to this area for, foie gras, which is the luxurious liver of force-fed geese and ducks. In fact, people come to this area more, for, I think, for that than they do the famous caves or the castles or the river. That's kind of the, um, the raison d'etre of the area. From I got to just bust in here because just to just to remember walking through these markets with Steve Smith, he's my good buddy. I've been working with him for 20 or 30 years. Uh, Steve is the co-author of our France book. I mean, he's basically the spearhead of the France book. He knows and loves France better than anybody I've ever met. Uh, and he's essentially written our France book and our Paris book. And it's just been Steve's mission to help Americans appreciate French culture. I'm so thankful to have Steve on our staff. And every year I look forward to spending eight or 10 days in France with Steve working on the book together. And walking right there just reminds me of what a blessing Steve has been in our company. And uh, Steve is just, as I mentioned, passionate about helping people understand the French culture. So it's great to have Steve to meet us with our film crew and make sure we know what we're shooting. Culinary perspective. I mean, try something. Oui, oui, goose liver, okay. Which one is best? Well, the best is your, the one piece of duck liver. So piece. it's pure. It's yes, just yes, that. Mm. Huh? Wow, that's good. Hmm. Let's taste the difference. This should be strong, well, right? Well, duck is different. Duck is a strong, the goose is a sweet. Mm. Yeah, that's a good description. It's one strong, one sweet. Mm. You notice the mm -hmm. difference? Mm -hmm. This square of the geese is a reminder that birds are serious business here and have been since the Middle Ages. Many question the morality of force feeding geese to make the foie gras. To learn Hey, uh, I'm just, we're heading out to a goose farm here, but I'm just ready to, oh God, this, this is, I just, I wish you could smell it. The smell of this beautiful melting mountain cheese <laughs> from the French Alps. And I'm going to drizzle it. I'm going to, I'm going to branch out a little bit. Now I got my, I got my pear and my apple slices. Plus I got my walnuts. I got my little onions and my uh, boiled potatoes, but um, I'm starting to get this right. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can do <laughs> rocklet quite right, but I can do it Rick. That's for sure. So there, here we go. And I'm just going to drizzle this. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that is going to make my pears and my apples and my boiled potatoes and my little onions unforgettable. Hey, we are going right now to a farm, a goose farm. And I know it's controversy and a lot of people just are really just cannot accept force feeding the geese to make their livers get big so they can slaughter them and eat the foie gras. But I would say, first of all, as a travel writer and a tour guide, it's not my job to moralize or to censor. It's my job to learn and share. And if you want to learn and share about a custom and a tradition and a livelihood that's been going on for centuries in France, you can go to a farm and you can walk through the farm, through the geese, with somebody whose family has been raising geese for a century and learn from that person about their livelihood, producing foie gras. So that's what we're going to do. And then you can go away with the opinion that feels right to you. Let's go now to the goose farm in the Dordogne and learn about foie gras. More about this, we're heading into the countryside to actually visit a goose farm. For generations, the Mazet family has raised geese right here. Natalie, clearly in love with the country life, enthusiastically shows guests around her idyllic farm. Each evening, she leads a family-friendly tour, explaining the age-old tradition of la gavage, force-feeding the geese to fatten their livers to make the much-loved goose liver pâté, or foie gras. In the farm, we have 1,000 geese each year, and uh, this one are six weeks old. And during the day, they are outside, and they come back inside during the night. A goose cannot stay in a small box. She will die. She need to walk, she need to hit grass. These birds are migrators. And before doing the migration, they eat a lot. They make a foie gras. They store energy on the liver to be able to fly. So it's their natural gas It's tank. a natural way to store energy, yeah. 
<laughs> Natalie explains why locals see the force feeding as humane, the same as raising any other animal for human consumption. French enthusiasts of La Gavage say that the animals are calm, in no pain, and are designed to gorge naturally. Dordogne geese live lives at least as comfy as other farm animals that many people have no problem eating. And they're slaughtered as humanely as any non-human can expect in this food chain existence. Does this not hurt the goose to put the no, tube down? No, no, no. The, the tube can go very easily on the top of the stomach because a goose naturally can hit big stone or a big corn on a cob. A goose can eat a corn on a cob? Yes, so the tube is not very big for, for a goose. To have a good foie gras, the geese must have a good life outside or, and during the force feeding. The region's cuisine is a big draw here. We're dropping by a favorite restaurant of Steve's to enjoy the local specialties. Gourmet eaters flock to this region for its goose, duck, pâtés, white asparagus, and more. Mm. Boy, oh boy. We're working hard here. <laughs> I love my work, I got to tell you. Look at this. We're right there on the river. Beautiful late light in the day. Beautiful local traditional cuisine. There's Simon, our producer. Um, Carl, the cameraman, he's got his plate. He doesn't get eaten until we're done eating, shooting, though, because he's got a lot of work to do. It's tough for the cameraman with all the great food, but his appetite is for making a good show, and he just nails it. Carl or Peter or whoever's filming our show, they do a great job. But I'm so thankful to have Steve. Steve knows all these places, and this is where we get to take our groups, and this is what we get to highlight in our guidebooks and include in our TV shows. But here we are, enjoying the ultimate setting with the ultimate meal on the ultimate river in France, the Dordogne River Valley. Et la trilogie de foie gras. Donc vous avez au torchon, au confit et au vin. Et c'est conseillé de le manger confit, torchon et au vin. Okay. Voilà, bon appétit, messieurs. Thank you. Merci. You're going to have to help me. What are the, this is three different foie gras, right? Welcome to the Dordogne. Okay. All right, you've got three foie gras here. This one's confit, which is a foie gras cooked in its own fat. Okay. This, the middle one, they call it confit au torchon, which right. means it's cooked with like a, a veil of chiffon around it. And the third one is a straight uh, foie gras. Oh, you know, I can taste a difference. There's a real there. clear difference. I like this very much. In okay. Excuse me, I'm eating with my food in my mouth, but um, good food, it's good travel, and I got good company. It's good wine too. Um, I want to remind you, we're going to Tuscany now, but I also want to remind you that we got Q&A coming up in a little while. So if you got any questions, type them in to the little widget there. And I'd love to, um, Julianne will be there and taking your questions and we'll have a Q&A period in just a little while. I want to thank Julianne and Ben and Gabe for our, on our Monday night travel team. Couldn't do this without our, our team. And Julianne and Ben and Gabe, they're there to answer your questions, to make sure everything gets off in the right way and just make sure our tech is all good. It's just great to have you and it's great to have them. I also want to remind you that all of these are little clips from TV shows. You can watch the entire shows with the whole context of the clip anytime you want. If you just go to ricksteves.com into the TV section and click on that. So now we're going to go to Italy, specifically Tuscany, not to famous places, but to the salt to the earth rural countryside of Tuscany and see what stocks these markets. I mean, these are people that really love the land. We're going to see somebody who makes cheese and we're going to visit with a gentleman pig farmer and learn about prosciutto. It's still possible to find your own sleepy, fortified village. While tourists pack the more famous places, little offbeat gems like this remain overlooked and are great places for enjoying the traditional culture. Hamlets like these originated as communities of farmers who banded together on easily defensible hilltops overlooking their farmland. With today's tourism and relative affluence, it's easy to forget the fact that until the last generation, this region was quite poor. Today, while the poverty's gone, the traditions survive. Many rural families still preserve their own meats and enjoy firing up their wood-burning ovens on special occasions. 
And here in rural Tuscany, you feel an enthusiasm for tradition. Mm. Mm. Gazing at these content sheep, you can almost taste the Pecorino cheese, which seems to be a part of every meal. At this farm, walls are stacked with rounds of Pecorino, made from the unpasteurized, and therefore tastier, milk of the farm's sheep. Mm. Making cheese this way is labor-intensive and takes lots of patience. But for these folks, it's well worth the trouble. To be sure we get the most out of our visit, we're joined by my friend and fellow tour guide, Roberto Becchi. We're visiting the noble farm of the Zanda family, where Nicola raises a couple hundred pigs. These pigs are a rare breed brought back from the edge of extinction by people who care about traditional agriculture, people who really love their ham. Can you hear the call? <laughs> so fun to see this elegant aristocratic farmer feeding the pigs. We're with Roberto there. You've met him before. He's our local fixer in Tuscany. And Roberto's got his own tour company, Tours by Roberto. And he's always there when our groups come to town, when we're researching our guidebook, making a TV show. We got Roberto to help us out. And um, here we're going to see again that Italian passion for the ingredients. Italians love to see from where their food came. They really understand it. And they have high expectations. They just really want the quality. So it's Italian justice. We feed them, they feed us. Yeah. yeah. Now, like the pigs all eventually do, we move on to the prosciutto part of the farm. Nicola artfully cures every part of the pig. The hind legs are destined to become fine prosciutto. He brushes on a coat of garlic and vinegar with a sprig of rosemary, sprinkles it with pepper, and finally cakes it in salt. Top grade prosciutto is cured by hanging in a cool room for about a year. During the slow curing mm. process, Nicola checks the progress, employing a wooden needle and an expert nose. And like any proud farmer, he invites us into his home. Not your everyday farmhouse, for a memorable taste. From the farm to the table, with only a little bit of travel, 200 meters. 200 meters, <laughs> but uh, a lot of work. A lot of work. How many months? Uh, about uh, 15 months. And then the ham is waiting? The ham is waiting about uh, 12 months. Oh, so more than two years. Yeah. Nicola, three different meats. Can you give me a little tour? This is ham, prosciutto. We have soppressata. It's done with the heads of the pigs. Mm -hmm. And we have the salami here. You like this? Oh, I love it. This is from the head of the beautiful pigs I was just feeding. Is it good? Do you eat it, Nicola? Okay, I'm about to eat the head of the pig, so Prasato. <laughs> just had uh, Samantha Brown on our show a couple weeks ago, and uh, we were talking about how when you're a TV host, you, you, you got to eat things, and pretty much they expect you to go, mmm, that was so good. But um, it's not always that good, but I think this is a good, um, a good way to do it here. You can just kind of go, oh, I'm so glad I tried this. Yeah, try it. Try it. Try it. Hmm. I think you like yeah, it. yes. it's like prosciutto for beginners, and this is for the expert. For the expert. The connoisseur. Perfect. With some good wine. Always with good wine. Nearby is the Vecchio Molino, or Old Mill. Well, this swan thinks this pool's made for him. It's actually a reservoir used to power the mill. This mill with its ancient grindstones has been producing flour for generations. Until the 1960s, neighboring farmers brought their grain here. While locals know stone ground corn makes the tastiest polenta, corn mill. polenta. mills like these are a tough fit in our fast-paced world. So that was a good look at the magic of Italy from the countryside's point of view. and. Uh, in a moment, we're going to go to Portugal, but I'm just going to take a, a little moment now. We put together a, a a little video here, just a video clip. It's like 28 needles in 90 seconds, trying to remind our countrymen, our neighbors, that if we're going to travel again, we need to get our shots. I just got my second shot. Here I am getting my first shot. And the end of this little series, this montage is me getting my second shot. But I just want to remind you, we're on this together. And if we don't get our shots, we don't travel. You know, this boat cannot sail until we're all on board. We all have our funny little hangups, and that's just fine. 
But if I have a funny little hang up and it keeps you down, it's not right for me to insist on my hang up to be part of your world. We need to get our shots. We're going to get our shots and then we're going to travel on. So here, let's just think about all these great travelers. They're getting their shots. They've got their keep on traveling t-shirts on. I got my keep on traveling t-shirt right here. We're holding our passports. It's our declaration of freedom. We're going to be traveling. Yes, we're all in this together. Get your jab. <laughs> We've got, by the way, all of our t-shirts, these beautiful keep on traveling t-shirts. They're half price right now uh, in our web store at ricksteves.com. We're certainly not making any money on that, but you can get your t-shirts for half price. And then we can all celebrate the science that's going to give us freedom from this darn pandemic. I want to take just a moment now, a little word from our sponsor, to give you a look at my newest book, For the Love of Europe. And we've been meeting all of these wonderful people in the countryside and the markets. This is a 400-page book, this For the Love of Europe, that introduces you to the backstory of all this travel fun. It's a book that'll be a great opportunity to bring to life all of these travel memories. Check this out. For the Love of Europe shares my favorite memories from decades of travel in 100 essays. This book, filled with vivid photos, is both intimate and fun to read. My greatest hits collection of Europe's most exciting experiences. You'll enjoy an all-day walk along an alpine ridge, soak up the French countryside on a canal barge, and take a friendly swing with a bell ringer in a medieval church spire. It's just you and me as we discover lonesome stone circles, explore ruined castles, and peek in on Europe's leading pipe organist at work. We'll join pilgrims on the Camino de Santiago, hear a French farmer's defense of foie gras, and shake up our livers with an English lord on his old exercise chair. We bounce up and down. And we'll party from Oktoberfest in Munich to the April Fair in Sevilla and go to the races from Siena to Pompolona. And we'll feast from the streets of Istanbul to the toughest bars of San Sebastian. Rather than a guidebook, For the Love of Europe shares tales of a lifetime love affair with Europe. It's 400 pages of travel fun, frolic, and inspiration. My favorite places, people, and stories guaranteed to stoke vivid dreams of happy travel. Now I just want to take you on a quick little trip into the recording studio because my publisher wanted me to make an audio version of this book. So I spent the better part of a week, I think six days, six long days in a sweaty little recording studio in a little recording box, reading this book out loud. I thought it was going to be a drag, but it was actually a joy because I was there in the moment with all of these favorite experiences in Europe. Here's where I lived while I made the audio book and the audio book is one way to consume this book.
But Lorenzo, who ran Il Castello, was a rare Vernazzan who didn't take advantage of tourists held captive by his town's beauty. He'd sit me down under an umbrella with the most commanding view in town, and then with the love of a small town priest, he'd put a cookie next to my glass of cool, sweet Chakitra wine and say, rest here, the view is nice. Wow, I am just about done reading this brand new book, Rick Steves for the Love of Europe. And I am so excited to be sharing with you my 100 favorite travel adventures in this collection of essays. If any book that I've written over the years is just made to order for an audiobook, it's got to be this one. I've been in this recording booth now for <laughs> five, seven hour stints, and I'm so excited about this book. If you're looking for an audiobook to take you to Europe, to stoke your travel dreams, be sure to get Rick Steves for the Love of Europe. In Portugal, this okay, now we're going to go to Portugal and look at this market. This is a classic old world market all over Europe. Old world markets are having a tough time surviving. And what they're finding is they can be revitalized by turning into a hybrid of a food circus as well as a traditional marketplace. And it's not like you're strip mall or your uh, shopping mall food circuit for all the chain stores. The food outlets in there, the little tiny restaurant stalls are usually uh, branches of a big established and well-respected restaurant in town. And they just want to expose their cooking the travelers. And uh, it's just a delight. But everywhere in Europe, you've got a colorful market like this, whether it's a complete market or if it's a mix of a food circus and a market, it's worth checking out. I did want to include in our string of marketplace experiences, a guided tour of a market. Usually you can find tours of these markets, like we're going to join right now. We're going to join a food tour by Andre, and we're going to learn about the market, uh, which is sort of fundamental to Portuguese cuisine and culture with the help of a local expert. Let's go. The city of Porto's traditional market manages to survive in spite of competition from modern shopping malls. This is a great place to wander, especially in the morning, to take in the sights, sounds, and smells of real-world Porto. And for the best understanding of the local food scene, we're taking a food tour. So I booked Andre just for our TV shoot, and I wanted to have his half a day to work on this, but I needed tourists to be on a tour. So I just scrambled around and I found tourists that were free the next morning. They met us. So we have these people that are handpicked to join us on the tour, and they were really good. They got a free tour, a lot of nice food, and we got to shoot our market scene. Welcome to Taste Porto Food Tours, Vintage Food Tour. My name is Andre. I'm going to be your tour guide today, trying to show you the best of Porto's gastronomy, sprinkling it with a bit of history, architecture, and culture. Food tours are popular throughout Europe for travelers who want to learn about the culture through its cuisine. With Andre as our guide, we'll enjoy a series of tasty stops. First up, the seafood section and Portugal's most famous fish, the sardine. Okay, so the main difference in between a tiny and a fully grown one. As you can see, tiny one you can eat from head to tail after you fry it, which I love. Skin to bone, don't waste anything there, okay? And this is the mama. Fat content is crucial. If you want a good sardine, it has to be like this because that's the fat content will keep all of the flavors in when you grill them. But look at those eyes, shiny and bright. They're gonna be delicious. <gasps> Next, we head to a shop with every type of seafood imaginable, but served only in tin cans, all artfully displayed. This shop over here is owned by the Portuguese Association of the Can Industry. So here you'll find over 19 brands uh, with over 300 different products, from sardines to codfish, uh, sea bass, sea bream, tuna fish, eels, lamprey, octopus, squid, mussels. It's fish, it's in a can, they got it. If it's fish, <laughs> if it's in a can, they got it. That is just a fun line from skin to bone. You eat everything. Andre does this tour almost every day. 
but he got this energy. He just loves his work. I love how Europeans find their niches. Here you can see the little table they set up. You know, these food tours, you'll find them all over Europe, by the way, all over the United States. Um, these um, shops love to have a little extra business and Andre makes an appointment. He calls as we're walking. He says, so we'll be there in eight minutes. We've got about, we got eight people. And then we come and we have the little table set up. They usually design the tour so you're there not during peak time where they can handle a chance for Americans to sit and take a bit of their shop. And today you're gonna sample here two of my favorite ones. First of all, this one over here, this in Portuguese we call it pica. It's actually a tiny needle fish. So it's less fatty than a sardine. It has been canned with olive oil and chili peppers. And to go along with it, mackerel in tomato sauce. And to hydrate yourselves also, a glass of vinho verde, a glass uh -huh. wine. So once again, as I taught you a while ago, a nossa. Who knew? Vino Verde is the perfect match for picas with chili peppers and mackerel. By the way, Vino Verde, it sounds like green wine. It's not the color green, it's, it's um, young wine. It's a white wine that's very fresh and it's Vino Verde. I love it when I'm in Portugal, great with fish. Next, we walk a few blocks to one of the oldest shops in the market area. Welcome to Merceria de Bulhão. This shop opened in 1896, back then working as a grocery store, cafe and bakery. Uh, the wealthiest families of Porto came over here for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea before adding to the market. But if you look around, you will see wine, spices, coffee beans, cheese, ham, codfish, fruit, vegetables, and even bread that is delivered here daily. And for you today, this is fular. Fular is a wheat and olive oil bread with bacon and sausage baked in. It's fluffy, savory, and sweet. A fantastic combination. Mm. A light bread that actually was delivered here this morning. It just occurred to me, it's, it's really fun to be eating and watching food at the same time. And as I'm eating this, this French salad, I'm having this lardon. And that's the French way of doing their bacon. And um, it reminds me, the French love to put little bits of wonderful, wonderful meat and, and often the soft meats. I mean, in a moment, we're gonna go to a place and we're gonna have a whole plate of gizzards. Reminds me in French, my favorite salad is the salad guise, the gizzard salad. It's a bunch of greens with beautifully done soft meats uh, like these uh, lardons, like this bacon. So light, mm. I think I'll have one more piece. Mm. Actually, this is one of my favorite neighborhoods. Uh, Nearby, in the medieval part of town, we try some Porto pub grub. So, welcome to Tashka. This is a farm-to-table tavern um, in which you'll find here products uh, just like smoked ham. These smoked ham legs, aged for 24 months, made out of a special breed of pork called bizaru, which only exists in the north of the country. And you can have it already pre-sliced over here for you as well. But you can find a lot more stuff in taverns like this. For instance, the octopus salad uh, with a lot of olive oil, uh, green and red uh, bell peppers, delicious, fresh. And here, mm. one of my favorites, stewed chicken gizzards in tomato sauce and chili peppers. So they're really hot, <laughs> as I say. And to go along with all of this, you're gonna drink a sparkling rosé vinho verde so light and bubbly to help it go down and to keep your palates wide awake. So bon appetit, enjoy. An interesting variety of simple foods, well-prepared and with refreshing local wine. And that's what food tours are all about. Food tours, they're happening all over Europe. It's a great way to get to know the culture, have a lot of fun, get some exercise, and have a meal at the same time. And there you go. I hope you enjoyed those markets. I want to remind you those uh, various food tours, they cost between oh, 15 and $80. They take about four hours. You visit six or seven places. Think of it as a dinner and a tour and uh, sort of an activity out and about, getting to know some people, learning the culture. I find they're generally pretty darn good. Hey, um, Julianne, do we have any questions? Yes, we have some great questions tonight. But first, can we have a word from our sponsor? Well, thank you. Our sponsor is uh, The Adventures of Raclette. I just, I'm, I'm having so much fun with this. I'm, I'm going to drizzle it now on my pears and apples. And I'm going to call that 
dessert. Oh, God, wow. that's good. Um, and I'm enjoying this excuse every Monday to try something new. I, I mean, I wouldn't normally have a rocklet grill here in my house, but <laughs> I think it's good. So thank you for being part of Monday Night Travel. Uh, we've already had our ads and so on. I just do want to remind you that Rick Steves Europe is um, 100 hardworking travel lovers. And we've got, uh, we're right now we're not able to sell our tours, but we are together and we are prepared. We're in touch with our bus drivers, our hotels and our guides in Europe. Uh, we've got thousands of people's names on our wish lists and we are hoping to open it up and throttle up for tours or bus tours late this year. There's a good chance we'll be traveling late this year. If not, it'll certainly be early next year. So, um, you know, stay in touch with us. If you want to get your name on a, on a tour, just go to ricksteves.com and, and, and put your name there and you'll be the first one to know about your tour. But all of these experiences we're celebrating today, hey, that's what our tours are all about. So if it looks good to you, you can have that experience yourself. Thank you so much. Also, I want to remind you, just, uh, just yesterday, I was on uh, CBS uh, Sunday morning, and it was just great fun. The crew came here, and they, they were interested in what's the travel guy doing when he's not able to travel. They did a wonderful five-minute clip, and you can see it on their website very easily. Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, CBS also had the 60 Minutes crew here, and they did a bit on me and my, my work and so on. And you can still find that if you, if you search for it. But uh, it's just great to be working and uh, enthusing about travel and keeping our staff together and knowing that this pandemic can derail our plans, our plans but it can't stop our dreams. And we're going to be traveling again together soon. Okay, Julianne, let's have some questions. Great. So our first question comes from Bra Bronwyn, and she was wondering, what are some of the most useful phrases to know and practice when shopping at a market? You know, I like complimenti. I, I always think in terms of Italian. It's, I guess yes. it's my favorite country. Complimenti. It's just, it's a compliment. My, my compliments to the chef. Complimenti. Mm -hmm. I also like bon lavoro. You know, um, best wishes with your work. Bon lavoro in Italian. Uh, you got to know, you know, how much you got to know, uh, please and thank you. You got to know, excuse me. There's that arsenal of basic words that are on the inside of the, the cover of most guidebooks. You, you know, learn those. And then uh, remember, it's a commotion when you're in the market, when you're in a pub, when you're in a bar, it's a commotion and the tourist gets muscled back because the local people are there for business. They don't care about your travel experience. They're there to buy their, <laughs> their, their fruit, you know? So you just got to realize that and uh, kind of be easy going with it. Uh, but the nice, the, fr the friendly words, you'll notice in France, uh, every time Delphine went into a shop, obviously it was bonjour madame, bonjour mm -hmm. monsieur, au revoir, merci. Those simple words, that's all you really got to know. And you'll find that young people, well-educated people and people in tourism, they speak enough English to help you out. Yeah. That's great. We did see a lot of great samples being handed out tonight. And Ted was wondering, do you have to pay for these samples or are they free? Oh, you would never pay for a sample. I mean, <laughs> I think that's almost a contradiction in terms. Um, a sample is they want you to buy and they'll give you a little sample. You saw me and Steve in the market there. I'm just going to have a sample of my melted mountain cheese on a piece of apple here. Mm. And if I was in the market, I'd buy some, you know. Yep. Um, but they were handing out, he had a whole bowl of crackers four samples. Mm -hmm. You can't pull up a chair and have lunch there, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but enjoy the samples. Don't be shy. They're doing fine. They love to hand out little samples and you'll find samples in markets all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And then this is kind of an interesting question. Benjamin was wondering, um, have you found that tourists are taken advantage of with prices in markets or are they usually pretty fair? You got to be careful. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people have the philosophy, oh, go ahead, you know, rip me off. I don't care. It's all it's all yeah. fine. Yeah. And other people, you know, as a matter of principle, I've got enough mm -hmm. money to be paying 50% more than I should for my carrots. But as a matter of principle, I want to be respected like, like a local. So I want to be charged fairly. And mm -hmm. I can't keep track of all the numbers. It's too fast. And there's people behind me that want to get in there. And I don't want to be kind of a high maintenance jerk at the, in the market. Yeah. But what I do, because you're looking, you're, you're having to translate two things you know, to the local currency, and then from pounds to metric to kilos. So it's quite a trick <laughs> to really know what you're supposed to be paying. Yeah. But what I do, everything should be priced, and they are priced. If it's not priced, then you should be suspect. If you see produce that's not priced, it's usually a touristy area, where then they have the freedom to, to have flexible pricing, one mm -hmm. for locals, one for tourists. Mm -hmm. I like to consume where the prices are explicit. And then what I do, I look at the prices as if I'm figuring it out. And then I watch him weigh, I watch him weigh it. 
<laughs> and then I think he is not going to be bold enough to rip me off blatantly because I've yeah. been paying attention that way. I'm just daydreaming. I have no idea what they're going to end yeah. up charging. <laughs> me. But that for me really helps. But yeah, be on um, <laughs> trust but verify. I think there's a yeah. there, there's some kind of a phrase like that in the market in Ljubljana in Slovenia that I thought was really cute, even for the local <laughs> people. Trust but verify. Yeah, yeah. Those are good tips. Good to know. And then just shifting away from markets really quickly, we've been getting a lot of comments about your Beatles poster in the back. Yeah. A lot of people, oh, is it the Beatles? Yes. And Steve's nine-year-old daughter was wondering, what is your favorite Beatles song? You know, everybody's looking at my Beatles poster. You can hardly see it. I'm going <laughs> to take it off the wall here forever. I love this poster. Oh, oh these guys, they're so cute. It's so innocent. And these are my boys. Look at that. And look how the line, look how the eyes are lined up. A lot of times when I have friends over, one of us will get on the other side and the other will be the other side. And we'll be <laughs> Fab five. <laughs> right there with them. You could be on the other side, Julia. Um, but th those are the Beatles. Uh, there's a it's a British rock band from a long time. It's Paul McCartney's earlier group, I guess you could say. Um, but um, I bought that just at a one of these uh, big um, countryside farmer antique shops in eastern Washington a spontaneous buy but not much has made it on my walls and I just for some for some reason I love it but um, I don't know what, what was the end of that question <laughs> do you have a favorite Beatles song oh a favorite Beatles songs yeah. well the slow revolution what is it revolution number one mm. you say you want a revolution shooby do wop bop shooby do wop bop I love that and I love hello goodbye and when I bought my car, it came with Sirius. And I thought, I'm not going to pay for Sirius. But then I realized, oh, it's got the Beatles channel. Ah. <laughs> so I, I've got Sirius just because of the Beatles channel. Every yeah. time I drive, there's a, there's a lifetime of obscure Beatle cuts and, and recordings yeah. and so on. So, yeah. But there's my Beatles information. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was special. The secret behind the poster has been revealed tonight <laughs> where it came from. <laughs> okay, now back to markets. Let's see what's next here. Look how oh. empty my hallway looks. I know, it's barren. Wrong. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Um, Sonia was wondering, do you have an overall favorite European market, if you can choose one? You know, I was thinking in France, because we were just, you know, um, traveling around and we were in Charlotte. France has all of these covered markets, these wonderful markets that are just so energetic and they're so passionate and they're so serious about their quality and they're so into the fine points of eating with the season and eating locally. And I would just say, whenever you're in a French town, make time to go to the market. It could be in a big city like Paris or Marseille, but more likely it's a smaller town and make, make time for the market. Having said that, you know, in the United States, where most of us feel like we have a unique market, you know, Seattle, Pike Place Market. Oh, mm -hmm. you got to go to Pike Place Market. Well, Portland's probably got one, and San Francisco's mm -hmm. probably got one, and San Diego's <laughs> probably got one. Um, in Europe, just markets are great, and markets are different. Every market is different. I mean, you go to you go to uh, a market in in uh, Tallinn, Estonia. It's going to be totally different than than Dublin, and it's going to be totally different than Athens. Oh, I'm just thinking about Athens. One great thing about markets is you get little tiny eateries there where they mm. serve. It's small stuff. It's munchy food, a little plate. It's dirt cheap. It's for the local shoppers, not for tourists. And it is, it is, the local culture just raw and and so intense, and I just love it. And I, I think if you wanted. I could almost write an essay called Raw, Intense, Local Culture, and then <laughs> feature a whole bunch of uh, eating experiences in markets, not buying the food in the markets, but eating experiences mm. in, in uh, Galicia, uh, or San Sebastian, uh, no, um, Santiago de Compostela, the northwest of Spain, where the mm -hmm. Camino ends. Um, everybody likes to eat barnacles. Barnacles are really expensive in, in the restaurants and the bars. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, and uh, it's, it's, you, you, you eat it as your, your beer nuts with your beer or your wine. And so mm -hmm. You can buy your barnacles in the market and there's little cafes there that will boil your barnacles for you. Oh, cool. just, for, uh, just for a couple of bucks and you buy a drink and you bring your, your barnacles in, they boil them and they give them to you on a plate and you feel <laughs> You feel like, man, I just saved fifty percent on wow. my barnacles, <laughs> and, and 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 you're just so local. And then yeah. you know, oh, I'm just thinking of all all sorts mm -hmm. of tangents that way. Mm -hmm. The markets are where it's at. You could do a TV show in a market in every country. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And kind of building off of that, another question was, if you could choose or if you had to choose, would you rather have like a meal, I guess, at one of those small places in a market or foods that you buy in a market or at a nice restaurant like the one we saw tonight on that river there in Dordogne, oh. I think it was. I think it's hard to beat yeah. that one. But <laughs> you, you know what I would do, Julianne? Mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. have the market restaurant at lunch because mm -hmm. it's fast, it's yeah. fun, it's colorful. It's, it's just kind of mm -hmm. and uh, it's really good. I mean, and they're just slamming it out. They're just slamming it out. You got to crowd up there and get your plate of cockles or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then have your romantic sit down at sunset, like we were doing with the crew there. That's how I would do it for sure. Um, yeah. I don't like to waste a lot of time. I mean, good eating in Europe, fine dining, by definition, is almost take your, take your time. Mm -hmm. It's a contradiction to fine dine and say, I got to be out of here in an hour. So do your snappy, dine, snappy eating at lunchtime in a little eatery. And then do your fine dining, like you saw me and the guys there on the river uh, in the evening. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's the best of both worlds. That sounds great. <laughs> I like, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't going to say no to either of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and our final uh, question for tonight. Do you think that the Passagata will ever catch on in the U.S.? Wow. No, <laughs> I don't think it will. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go to Europe and I, all those Passagatas, everywhere I go, when I check into a hotel, I ask at the desk, where do people stroll? Where can mm -hmm. I find the Paseo? Circle it on the map. Oh, geez, I just dropped all my pickles. Oh no, the pickles. <laughs> <laughs> I was just too enthusiastic about Passagata. Um, and I find out where it is and mm -hmm. I will be there. And mm -hmm. here in the United States, when I come home, I feel like taking a walk and I don't know, there's no action on the streets. Mm -hmm. Maybe in some cities there are, but I almost feel like mothers see a strange man on the street and they grab their children and they bring them back into the yard, you know? Yeah. It's that, is that ill at easeness. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's founded on, on, on anything. I just think it's, we're not that used to being, living on top of each other, like in Europe. In Europe, they don't have big living rooms like I've got. They got tiny living rooms and they go down to the square you know, that's where they go and they have a drink and they hang out with their friends or they go to the pub. So, you know, I mean, we have that in certain cases, but when you're in Europe, enjoy the passeggiata, enjoy the paseo. It is, and with global warming, it's moving north. I mean, everybody's out strolling in the evening and yeah. it's just, cities are designed for it and it's a beautiful thing. I really like that. Hey, this has been so much fun tonight. Julianne, thank you for helping out. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to remind you next week, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to give a PowerPoint about uh, the irreverent history of Rick Steves Europe way back to our gnarly beginnings. It's kind of a it's, it's an irreverent history. I'm gonna just, um, I'm not going to hold any punches. So if you want to know about the Europe through the gutter days, mm, I'm just thinking of a few things I want to talk talk about come on in next monday after that two weeks from tonight we're going to have the uh, natural wonders of europe that's going to be a lot of fun and every monday after that we're going to be gathering right here because this is the place to be on monday night if you like traveling thank you so much for joining us and happy travels even if we're all just staying home for a little while <laughs>